Okay. Um, let's start. So let's go back to the, th the third rebellion. Um, they, then they said, come, let's build a great city for ourselves with a tower that reaches into the sky. They will make us famous and keep us from being scattered all over the world. So what, is, what does it teach us? Number one, teaches us that they, that, that they wanted to be famous. They wanted to make themselves famous. They wanted to stay together and they didn't want to go into the rest of the world. What was Adam's original instruction? Go and take Eden and the garden and spread it everywhere. And they wanted to stay in one place and build a monument to themselves. So what is God's response to that? Now remember, it's, it, remember it said that he split the nations and he sends them off and he says, but I kept Israel. But really all he did was he kept Abraham. Because that was all Israel was made up of. One man. One man. And so we, basically God said, I'm, I'm sick of all these guys who never ever want to serve me. I'm going to take one man. And what does he say to him? He says, I'm going to turn you into a nation. And I'm, I'm going to make you famous. So they said, we will make ourselves famous. God says to Abraham, I'm doing it. So it's a rejection of that rebellion. God's response to that rebellion in Genesis 10 and 11 is Abraham. And you will be a blessing to others. So my goal is to make you famous and then you're going to start blessing other people. And I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. And all the families or nations that God had just split off and sent off in different directions on the earth will be blessed through you. So God's immediate response to splitting up, them up into nations is to have a plan to get them back. So he punishes them and deals with their rebellion by splitting them up and bringing eternal disunity. But his goal, immediately he picks a man and he starts a plan in response to that rebellion. So that's why, that's why Genesis 12, 2 and 3, 1, 2 and 3 are the pivot on which the entire Bible hangs. Why? Because it's a pivot away from God working with everyone to working with a few to touch the many. Before he wanted to touch the many, he stopped that. He said, okay, off you go. Go, let, go get oppressed if you want to be oppressed. I'm going to work with one family. And then right through the Old Testament, we see that, that family messing up all the time. It's, key, it's yay, but ah. Oh. David, yay, but ah. Oh. Solomon, yay, but ah. Oh. Moses, yay, but ah. Oh. Israel, yay, but oh. And so he had to have another plan. Now, and, and so part of the covenant that God makes with Abraham is this. As the sun was going down, Abraham fell into a deep sleep and a terrifying darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to Abraham, you can be sure that your descendants will be strangers in a foreign land where they will be oppressed as slaves for 400 years. So there's 400 years you're going to be oppressed. Isn't it crazy that God told them beforehand? But I will punish the nations that enslave them, and in the end they will come away with the great wealth. With the great wealth. As for you, you will die in peace and be buried in a ripe old age. Listen to this. After four generations, your descendants will return here, to this land why can they return to the land only in four generations because the sins of the Amorite, Amorites do not warrant their destruction yet so I've reserved this land for you but they still need to stuff up enough that I can get rid of them so I've, I'm creating a land I'm creating a nation I've got a land reserved for you 
but I can't yet get rid of the inhabitants. So, Le- Leviticus 18, verse 24 to 25. It says, Do not defile yourself in any of these ways, for the Lord, for the people I'm driving out before you have defiled themselves in all the, these ways. Because the entire land has been defiled, I am punishing the people who live there. I will cause the land to vomit them out. So God knew that the people in that land were so evil that at a point the land would say, get out, I've had enough. <laughs> you've, you, it goes full up. It's too much. And so God had to take the nation out, the family out, and put them in Egypt for a while so that when the land was ready for them, he could come and he could get rid of the current inhabitants because they were so terrible, so evil. So, Genesis 15, verse 18 to 20 says, So the Lord made a covenant with Abraham that day and said, I have given you this land to their descendants all the way from the border of Egypt to the great Euphrates River, land now occupied by the Kenites, uh, Kenizzites, Kedmonites, Hittites, Perizzites, Raphaelites, Amorim. So God had a land. And, he, and it's very clear that the first part of the land was the land west of the Jordan. But the goal wasn't the land west of the Jordan. The land was all the way to the other end of Iraq. And this sounds exactly like what God said to Adam. I'm giving you the garden, but eventually your goal is to extend it, take over everything. In the same way, God puts them in the the land of Israel, says your job is to spread out. The guy that got closest to this, actually the only guy that really achieved this was Solomon. And unfortunately, what did he do? He went off and served other Elohim. And so everything fell apart. He went off and served other spirits. He went off and served demons. And so, um, it says in Exodus 34 verse 22, For I will drive out the other nations ahead of you and expand your territory so no one will covet and conquer your land while you appear before the Lord, your God, three times each year. So God said, when they arrive, they settle down. It's your land. I'm going to protect you so that you can serve me. So why? One of the things that we don't understand, we don't get, is to what extent Elohim rule over certain areas. And the reason they can rule is because the people want them to rule. When the Elohim had caused so much sin in that particular area, God could deal with them and the people and remove them so that he, he could take his possession, the land that he, the, the, the nation that he wants over, he could take them to a land. And then the rest of the history of the Bible is the fight over that land. In fact, they're still fighting over that land. It's the most disputed piece of land on the planet and has been for thousands of years. Why? Because it's a war between God and the Elohim. If the Elohim can stop the nation of Israel, they can put off their end. One of the questions was, I forgot, can, um, can Elohim die? Yes. The end, they're going to die like men. So who here is keen to die soon? And who here would prefer to put it off for a while? <coughs> a lot of you exercise even when you don't want to. You eat better. A lot of you used to love smoking. You stopped smoking because you realized that would bring it forward. You do whatever you can to put your date of death off. Elohim are the same. They are going to die. 
So they're going to fight with everything they can to put off the date of their death. So, um, but not God didn't just have this nation as a plan. He wanted, remember what was his promise to Abraham? I'll make you a nation and through you all the nations will be blessed. So God hadn't abandoned the nations. He has a plan to get the nations back. How? Through his nation. So, let's see. In Isaiah it says, Arise, Jerusalem, let your light shine for all to see, for the glory of the Lord rises to shine on you. Darkness as black as night covers all the nations of the earth, but the glory of the Lord rises and appears over you. All nations will come to your light. Mighty kings will come to see your radiance. So God's plan is what? I'm going to build a nation that's so blessed, so that the nations will come to it. That's God's plan. It wasn't to work with each nation. His plan was to make a nation that all the other nations will come back to him. In fact, we have a, we have a specific prophecy about Africa. Zephaniah 3 verse 9 to 11. Pastor Shannon, it's for you as well. Then I will purify the speech of all people. That's praying in tongues. So that everyone can worship God to the Lord together. So when we pray in tongues, what are we doing? Pure language, we can worship God together. My scattered people who live beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, are you south of the rivers of Ethiopia, Pastor Shannon, from Israel? So are we. So the scattered people, so we are the, the nations that are scattered south of Ethiopia, will come to present their offerings. On that day, you will no longer need to be ashamed, for you will no longer be rebels against me. No longer be Genesis 10 and 11 rebels. I will remove all proud and arrogant people from among you. There will be no more haughtiness on my holy mountain. That's for Africa. Which is why God, why the Elohim promote tribalism and racism in Africa. It's their way of putting this off because when this starts to happen in huge scale, their day is coming. So, say, so, well, what about Jesus? So, Matthew 4, verse 8 to 10. Next, the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I will give it to all of you, he said. If you will kneel down and worship me. Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him. For the scriptures say, you must worship the Lord your God and serve him, only him. Who controlled the nations at that stage? Jesus doesn't say, you're lying to me, Satan. Get behind me. You're lying. You don't control the nations. Jesus understood that God had handed the handed the nations they had voted they had voted God out and they had voted the Elohim in and because they had voted the Elohim in what happens Satan controls the nations Satan controls the nations and so Jesus doesn't what Jesus is saying there is I don't need your help to get the nations back I don't need you. I'm getting them back. You may control them now, but I've got something up my sleeve. And it was three years away. His brilliant, brilliant tactical master counter strike was waiting. The devil had no idea. He was totally blindsided. And so, and so Jesus starts going around. In Mark 1, verse 23 to 27, he says, Suddenly a, a man in the synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, Why are you interfering with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. 
But Jesus reprimanded him, Be quiet, come out of the man, he ordered. At that, the evil spirit screamed through the man into a convulsion and then came out of him. Amazement gripped the audience and they began to discuss what had happened. What sort of new teaching is this? They asked excitedly. It has such authority, even evil spirits obey his orders. So the teaching had such authority that demon spirits had to go. So that's where the authority came from before when he sent the disciples out. It was the power of the teaching. So demons have to... So then in John 11 verses 30 to 33 it says, Then Jesus told them, The voice was from, for your benefit, not mine. The time for judging the, this world has come when Satan, the ruler of this world, will be cast out. So there's a time coming when Satan's going to be cast out. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. He said to this to indicate how he was going to die. So at a point, the, Satan was going to be disarmed. And it was when he was lifted up on that cross. We, the devil thought it was the greatest victory. Jesus thought it was his enthronement. From that point, when he ascended to heaven, he, he was able to take his position on the throne next to Jesus. Next to the Father himself, sorry. And we see again the importance of the crucifixion and resurrection. Colossians 2, 14 to 15. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. So he, these rulers that had been dominating the nations, he, he shamed them through his victory over them. It's for us to go and enforce that victory. Now, And, and by, his, by his cross in Colossians 1 verse 11 to 13, it says, We are praying to you that you will be filled with his mighty glorious strength so that you can keep going no matter what happened. Always full of joy of the Lord and always thankful to the Father who has made us fit to share all the wonderful things that belong to those who live in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued you out of darkness and gloom of Satan's kingdom and brought us into the kingdom of his dear son who brought us freedom with his blood and forgave all our sins. So the cross created a new kingdom, a kingdom of light that we could go into. If you are not in that kingdom of light, you are in the kingdom of darkness and you are under the power of the demon spirits. Now, I need you to understand that the word Elohim can mean a good or a bad spirit. But I'm, I'm trying to show you the, the power of these supernatural beings. Because God is also an Elohim. But there are demon, <coughs> demon spirits. Elo, but they're supernatural beings who rule over a kingdom. And as long as you stay in that dark kingdom, as lo and one of the best ways to that, do that is ancestral worship. We saw in Alma Longa the effect of worshipping those Elohim through ancestral worship was crime, alcoholism, violence, poverty. Where have we seen that movie before? Worship that those Elohim. You put yourself under those Elohim. Don't be surprised of the consequences. Now this, this is quite interesting. So is Isaiah... Um, 68 verse 18 to 21. This is the last three verses of Isaiah. I will gather together all nations and people against Jerusalem where they shall see my glory. I will perform a mighty miracle against them and I will send those who escape to, as missionaries to the nations. So what happened was God, God prophesies that there would be a um, they'd be attack on Jerusalem and they would 
and his people would be, those who escaped, would spread around the world. Where would they go? They would go to Tarshish, Pat, Lad, Meshesh, Rosh, Tabul, Javan, and to the lands beyond the sea that, I, that, that they have not heard my fame or seen my glory. Now, if you go back to Genesis 10, you will find those lands there. So God's plan is, I'm go, there's going to be time where I'm going to be sending people out to go and recover the nations that I had sent off in Genesis 10 and 11. I'm going to bring them back. My goal is to bring them back. My goal is to reach out to them. And they shall declare my glory to the Gentiles. We are the Gentiles. And they shall bring back all your brethren from every nation as a gift to the Lord, transforming them, transporting them gently on horses and in chariots and, and in litters and mules and camels to my holy mount in Jerusalem, says the Lord. It will be like the offerings flowing into the temple of the Lord at harvest time, carried in vessels consecrated to the Lord. I will appoint some of those returning to be my priests and Levites, says the Lord. So we are priests and Levites. Why? Because we are Gentiles and God's plan was to send out the missionaries. And of course, the, the, ch the church split around the world after the Romans came and destroyed Jerusalem. And we are the product of it. Literally, he's, we have, he has brought us back to his spiritual Jerusalem, <coughs> his home. Now, how, where, did, where did God's big plan to get the nations back start? Because remember, the nations are hostile to him. <clears throat> the nations are against him. The nations are serving other Elohim. It starts in Acts chapter 2. Yeah, yeah, we are. So they're preaching to all the... <clears throat> and what's amazing is they're preaching to, they start preaching to all these guys from all the nations whose names appear in Genesis 10. Or the, the, the names may have changed, but from the same places. God brings all of them back to Jerusalem. He gives the disciples or the apostles, the 120, they start preaching in other tongues, but it's the tongues of the nations. The point of Acts chapter 2 was this is God's, God, God, Jesus had disarmed principalities and powers. He had disarmed them and now, he's, now he launches his counter strike to get the nations back in Acts chapter 2. This is where it starts. So Cappadocia, Pontus, Mesopotamia, Judea. Asia Minor, Pergia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the Cyrene languages, areas of Egypt, visitors from Rome, Rome, both Jews and Jewish converts, Cretans and Arabians. We all hear this man telling us our own languages about the mighty miracles of God. Acts chapter 2 is God's giant counter strike against, this is where the invasion starts. Acts, um, Jesus defeats principal, disarms principalities and powers. Now he starts to roll it out in Acts chapter 2. In fact, where, where was Paul most obsessed with getting to? I'll read it to you. In Romans 15 verse 23 to 24 but now at last i'm through with my work here and i'm ready to come after all these long years of waiting for i'm planning to take a trip to spain and when i do i'll stop off there in rome and after we've had a good time together for a little while you can send me on my way again why was paul so obsessed with spain Because in Genesis 10, it was listed as one of the nations, people that went to live there. And Paul understood that his mission was to start reversing Genesis 10. And if he didn't get to Spain, he wouldn't have done it yet. Paul saw his mission as reversing the splitting up of the nations. 
Paul's mission was to bring them all back to Jerusalem into the kingdom of God. And so, and, and so is our mission too. Our mission is to disciple our nation. But here's the thing. Let's look at the position of Jesus. <coughs> In Daniel 7 verse 9 to 10. It says, I watched this. Now this is, remember, this is Daniel looking into the throne room of God. I watched as thrones were put in place and the ancient one sat down to judge. So God is sitting in his throne room. God the Father. His clothing was as white as snow and his hair like purest wool and he sat on a fiery throne with wheels of blazing fire. Where did we see those wheels? Ezekiel 1. Wheel within the wheel. Those were the wheels of God's throne. <coughs> those were the wheels of God's throne. God has a throne with wheels. Why? Because he wants to get around. And a river of fire was pouring out, flowing from his presence. We think God is all by himself. Let me read this. Millions of angels ministered to him. That, that idea of God sitting by himself is wrong. <laughs> Millions of angels are around him. And minister to him. Many millions stood to attend him. So there were still more millions that were ready to attend him. This is not a God by, by himself. He's literally, where's God? Oh, he's with his millions and millions of angels. Then the court began its session and the books were opened. Let's jump to verse 13 and 14. As my vision continued that night, I saw someone like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient one and was led into his presence. He was given authority, honor, and sovereignty over all the nations of the world so that people of every race, nation, and language would obey him. His rule is eternal, never end. His kingdom will never be destroyed. When was Jesus seated at the right hand of the Father? When he ascended to heaven. Daniel saw Jesus' arrival into the throne room of heaven where he was put on a throne. Next to Jesus. And what was the product of him sitting next to Jesus? He's given authority, honor, and sovereignty over all nations of the world so that people of every race and nation and language would obey him. So God is taking back the authority from the Elohim over the nations. Um, and it's very clearly Jesus because Jehovah is repeatedly referred to as the cloud rider or the one that rides the sky. And the son of man, who Jesus repeatedly called himself, is the cloud rider. He says, I it says he comes riding on a cloud. Um, I just want to go back. Do you see there, what does the first line say? How many thrones are there? Thrones. Doesn't tell us how many, but if you add an S, it means plural. Hmm? Means more than, more than one. So Jesus is now at the right hand of the Father... And it says in Ephesians 3, verse 20 to 21, Look, I've been standing at the door and I'm constantly knocking. If anyone hears me calling him and opens the door, I will come in and fellowship with him and he with me. So Jesus says, I want to come and fellowship with you. This isn't 
I don't believe this is after the second coming. This is Jesus is standing. We use the scripture all the time for salvation. Am I right? Standing at the door at knock. He says, I let anyone who conquers sit besides me on my throne. I come and st- if you overcome power of Satan in your life, you're on a throne. Just as I took my place with my father on his throne when I had conquered. When did Jesus conquer? He conquered on the cross. So in Daniel 7, we see the enthronement of Jesus after he returns from the earth. After he's ascended, he is coronated and put on a throne. And he says, I want you to come sit with me. Come sit right by me. And when I had conquered, let those who hear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Now, this is, this is confirmation of what I'm saying. Ephesians 1 verse 20 to 21. I also pray that you will understand the incredible get- greatness of God's power for us who believe Him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated Him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. So Jesus is sitting in the heavenly realms. Daniel saw what was going to happen. Now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else. So he is now got power over all these Elohim. Right up until his death on the cross, he had to duck and dive the Elohim to pull off his plan. He's now been given power over the Elohim. Not only in the world, but also in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things in the benefit of the church. What is, where does Ephesians teach us? Where are we seated? In heavenly places with Christ. And so what is the product of all of this? Let's go to Revelation. If you want to... By the way, if we can, if someone can just tell Sandiru about just another five minutes. Just if someone could just warn them, we're ready. Okay, so what is the product of all of this? Let's jump to Revelation. Revelation 21, verse 23 to 27. And the city has no need of sun or moon. Remember, what was the sun or moon? They were representatives of the Elohim. For the glory of God it illuminates the city. No more need for them. And the Lamb is its light. The nations will walk in its light. So remember the nations that went off? In that city there will be nations who've returned to Him. And the Lamb is its light. The nations will walk in its light and the kings of the world will enter the city in all their glory. Its gates will never be closed at the end of of day because there is no night there. And all the nations will bring their glory and honor into the city. Nothing evil will be allowed to enter, nor anyone who practices shameful idolatry and dishonesty, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. So the nations that are going to be coming to heaven, to that city, at the end of the story, So in Genesis 12, God sends the nations off and says, fine, you want that that Elohim, go off and have him. He then does what? He defeats those Elohim at the cross. He tricks them. Greatest ambush in the history of the, in all of history. Catches them. Yeah. Then what does he do? He launches his counter-strike in Acts chapter 2. And at the end, there are nations that walk into, come into the city. So, I just want to check. Okay. So Ephesians 3 verse 6 to 11 says, And this is God's plan. Both Gentiles and Jews who believe the good news share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. Now remember the Jews were God's own possession. Remember that? Jews were God's own possession. But now the Gentiles are also able to equally share. So there's no differentiation between those nations that were sent off in Genesis 10 and 11, and the one he kept for himself. 
for if as, as long as we commit ourselves to Jesus, we inherit God's, we are become God's children. Both are part of the same body and both enjoy the promise of blessing because they belong to Jesus Christ. By God's grace and mighty power, I have been given the privilege of serving him by spending spreading this good news. Though I am the least deserving of God's people, he graciously gave me the privilege of telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them in Christ. So he, he's saying, I've got the privilege of going to fetch those nations. For God, I was chosen to explain to everyone this mysterious plan. Remember, it's a revealed secret that God, the creator of all things, has kept secret from the beginning. Listen to this. God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was his eternal pl plan, which he carried out through Jesus Christ our Lord. God's plan was to show, display to the rulers, the Elohim, that have fought against him and have fought against humankind, that he could unite us all into one. Right now, you look here, the people of all different races and languages and cultures, if you look around this room, it's a sign to the Elohim, the, the rebels, that their day is coming. And they hate this. That's why they fight this. That's why they fight and try and split us in race all the time. Because when the nations, oh, I can feel the presence of the Lord. <laughs> when the nations come together and unite, it's a sign that the men, that, 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 that these terrible spirits that have exploited you and I, the end is near. Because we're united in Jesus. So, what was God's great plan? Us united together in this room and everywhere else. And that's why, that's why I've, I've worked, I work so hard and pray about keeping our, our, our church multiracial because I believe it's, a, it's the greatest sign to the Elohim that God's plan of bringing the nations together back into one. In the last chapter, there is one people of every nation. That's his goal. So, Romans 8, verse 38 to 39. So, I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death, nor life, neither angels, nor demons. So, that what are they trying to, what are these demons trying to do? Separate us from God's love. That's what they're trying to do. Neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell. Powers of hell are doing, trying to do what? Separate us from the love of God. They're working right now to separate you from the love of God. They used COVID to separate many people from the love of God. There are many people that are not in church anymore. The rulers, the rulers in Wuhan cooked up a plan to destroy the nations called COVID. And they released it to the nations. Why? Because they hate the nations and they want to destroy the nations because they know that if, 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 because they, they want to delay the ultimate end. No power in the sky. What's, what power in the sky? It's the Elohim, the supernatural beings above or on the earth below. So the demons around us also trying to separate us from the love of God. Indeed, nothing in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. You've never read that scripture like that, am I right? This scripture is a scripture of spiritual warfare. He's like, oh, the love of God so great. Yes, it is. But there are demons, Elohim powers in the heavens and earth that are working every day to, dis to, to separate you from the love of God.
This is, this is one of the most powerful scripture. This is one of the most powerful spiritual warfare scriptures in the, all of the Bible. It, we say, oh, nothing will separate us from the love of God. What is it? It's demon spirits that are trying to do it. You are in a war. Literally, the devil is doing everything he can to separate you from the love of God. Are you going to allow it? Now we're going to, and, and I challenge you to bring the love of God to everyone else who is allowing, is allowing themselves to be separated from the love of God. And after the break, we'll talk about how we're going to counterattack. <laughs>